Sportages. Sport gets smarter. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Sportages cast. Be sure to like, subscribe, and follow wherever you're tuning in from because we've got a whole bunch of exciting things happening. Our guest today is a 23 year old sport climber from Melbourne, Australia, where we're based as well. Since beginning his international career in 2012, he's been national champion, World Cup semi finalist. And this year, he'll be heading over to Europe for the first time since the pandemic began to complete, compete on the World Cup circuit. Welcome to the show, Campbell Harrison. Hi, uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, excited to well, be here. Campbell, it's great to have you here. And obviously, we've, we've spoken before, but more on the editorial side of things at Sportages. And the discussion there was a lot to do with the Olympics and dealing with the pandemic. But... This time around, I thought, let's let's switch it up a little bit, uh, you know, talk a little bit about yourself and just just climbing in in Australia and your own experiences with things. So starting off, Campbell, uh, you know, like you've been climbing for a while. Do you think that the sport has become more accessible since you first started off? Uh, and, you know, why why do you think that is the case if so? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, I think in a lot of ways it has grown in terms of its accessibility and inclusivity and then in other ways, maybe less so. I think like as the sport has grown, um, it's definitely become more diverse. It's a much more diverse community than it used to be and people are involved in climbing for so many different reasons now than I think what I used to see when I first started climbing. Um, and so in that sense, yes, and I, it's way more inclusive of um, um, people with disabilities, people who come from different backgrounds um, and various factors. But then at the same time, as the sport has grown, it's also become a lot more expensive. Um, and so in that sense, maybe we lose some degree of accessibility, um, which is a problem. I think uh, I would hate for climbing to become a sport that you can only participate in if you have a, like a certain level of wealth, which I guess to a degree it already is, um, but it would definitely be, yeah. So in some ways, the, in a lot of ways, the accessibility has grown quite a degree. And then in some ways, I think that's so. So we still have work to do, I think. Yeah, that's really interesting because obviously, um, you know, you look at climbing as this very sort of community focused sport. There's a lot of social elements around it. You touched on the inclusivity so things like being accepting of everybody from everywhere, everyone working together, uh, you know, people more uh, than happy to help each other out when you go to a gym. But then there is this point of uh, the social divide almost where, you know, if which is very which is a very interesting point that you raise. I mean, do you potentially see it going down the direction of sports like golf and tennis where you know you have to have a certain amount of money like you said um and how do you sort of make sure that doesn't happen from your understanding and being around the sport how do you make sure it doesn't go into that elite sphere because that's not the roots of the sport don't come from the same place that a sport like tennis or golf or so on yeah. comes from it's very much grassroots everyone together Let's go climb, have a bit of fun, very social as well. Yeah, I wouldn't say that necessarily as an athlete, I have the expertise to uh, to answer that question fully. Um, I would like to think that we're not going to see climbing head into an elitist space. Um, I think uh, sports like golf, for instance, um, there's uh, such a huge um collection of resources that have to go into opening a space in which you can play golf um, and climbing doesn't necessarily it doesn't have the same necessity for those resources that the, the space and the time and the care um, i think uh there are you know various outreach groups within australia and across the world that are working hard to make climbing more inclusive for people um, across the socioeconomic spectrum and i guess i just hope that um you know, we can continue to, to work hard toward that goal and that um, there's enough competition amongst the gyms to, you know, keep prices of memberships and casual entries reasonable and 
um, facilitate the accessibility of, of uh, affordable gear and that sort of thing. And so, you know, all the all the building blocks are there. And I think we just have to keep pushing them in the right direction and ensure that, you know, the, the, the cost of it all doesn't grow too exponentially and everybody can get involved in climbing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And speaking of things like money and um, access to resources, one of the things that you've talked about uh, has been sponsorships and uh, perhaps the lack of them available to professional athletes within climbing here in Australia, such as yourself. Uh, what's that process been like for you to sort of get sponsors, try and reach out to sponsors? Have there been challenges? And if so, what have those challenges sort of, uh, what are the challenges that you've encountered? Yeah, so I guess in a sense, um, you know, comparative to a lot of other people within the Australian climbing community, I'm, I'm very lucky, I'm very fortunate to have um, a collection of super supportive sponsors. I'm sponsored by La Sportiva, Edel Ridd and MyClimb. And um, uh, they've, you know, especially La Sportiva have uh, stuck with me through, you know, some like really tough times and through some injuries and not necessarily being able to give as much to competition climbing as I would like. And so um, in that sense to have those sponsors who, you know, reached out to me um, and extended their support um, is super lucky. Um, but then in the same sense, you know, with the sport being where it is in terms of its growth, there's only so much that companies are able to offer to climbing athletes with the presence that most of us have being less so than a lot of other major sports. Um, and so one of the huge hurdles can be accruing um, sponsorship uh, in terms of accruing financial sponsorship, essentially. So often um, companies are keen to offer gear and that kind of support, which is without a doubt a necessity as an athlete. But, um, you know, in the end, the traveling over to Europe and through Asia to compete on the World Cup circuit, for instance, you know, um, you need money to pay rent for accommodation, you need money to buy food, you need money for travel. Um, and I think that's the, the biggest hurdle that professional climbers in Australia especially face um, is that we we struggle to accrue the financial sponsorship to be able to dedicate ourselves to full-time training. Um, and in that respect, we often are working part-time or even full-time jobs on top of uh, our, our training, which can amass to you know, uh, quite a lot of hours overall. So it's definitely a, um, a barrier that we have to overcome as professional athletes. And is that something that you do as well? Do you juggle... Uh, work and climbing simultaneously. So what is what is that like, uh, you know, sort of managing uh, time between those things? Yeah, so I work at a climbing gym. I work at the climbing gym that I spend most of my time training, um, which is super fortunate in that I can uh, easily slot my training sessions in before and after my shifts. Um, yes, that's that's really handy. But at the same time, it does mean I'm spending a lot of time in the one place at the gym that can get a bit tiresome and a bit monotonous at times. Um, yeah. And one way I try to combat that is just by visiting as many other gyms as possible. And when I get the opportunity, you know, trying to step out into new um, uh, training venues to like keep it interesting. Um, but yeah, sometimes when work my, when my work schedule is particularly heavy and then my training schedule is also particularly heavy, you know, it can easily become like, 70 hours inside the climbing gym um <laughs> which is wow uh, i think it's easy to understand that that can feel like a lot sometimes and so it's really important to manage that and make sure you know you're getting out and trying new things as well yeah that's 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 firstly that's insane uh 70 hours at you know i i uh would spend a maximum of 10 hours in the climbing gym a week if 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 not less than that but then again uh you you are the you are the pro uh, but what I find interesting on that note, Campbell, is that, you know, you, you touched on it being so mon it can get monotonous you, when you get really, really busy with both schedules essentially colliding with one another. Um, I would imagine to a large extent that uh, aspects of mental well-being and your mental health come into play. And 
how do you think you know this is this is a topic that's becoming more and more prominent amongst athletes and within sport and perhaps it wasn't even 10 years ago so when we look at um mental health in your personal experience uh you know how important has focusing on your mental well-being and your you know your your well-being at that level uh enabled you to sort of grow with your physical performance but also just competing and also your training and so on mm yeah so like obviously without going into you know like too much detail this is uh definitely like a very personal um yeah. topic for me and um and and a super important one i think athletes especially are particularly um vulnerable to struggling with mental health issues i just think the lifestyle that we lead that's so um heavily places such heavy value on on performance and um restriction at times and commitment and 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 discipline it's easy to fall into sort of like self-destructive cycles and so i think um maintaining your mental health is absolutely crucial to being a successful athlete and um something that i think i've only given um sufficient attention to over the last you know couple of years um and seeing the the work that i've done in that space like bear such fruit has been um really eye opening and really special and has very much uh positively impacted my like capacity to grow as an athlete and to perform um it's been quite uh eye opening um i think so yeah super important something that you have to make sure you're taking care of and i think it's easy to as an athlete you know we push and we push and we push and it's really easy to just sort of fall in this headspace that it's not important that it doesn't matter that you'll just push through um and i think it's it's really important sometimes to sit back and acknowledge that like no it's it's not normal to feel these ways and um there is something you can do about it and you'll feel a lot better on the other side for sure yeah absolutely look um it's definitely uh from you know not uh from a lot of the people that i speak to and uh, miss several athletes such as yourself you know it is such a key part and i think it's also a responsibility of sort of the uh federal bodies and organizations working with athletes to be responsible to a certain extent of making sure uh that performance and productivity don't necessarily hamper uh the athlete's well-being uh on that note is you know i i come across athletes some who like you touched on it being very very personal uh some athletes look at it as a very internal process whereas others go out and uh seek out support from you know be it sports psychologists mental coaches is that something that you if you don't mind sharing of course uh something that you've looked into something that you've done and what is what are the opportunities for that within climbing in australia because in a lot of the bigger sports it's very prominent so you know the the AFL and rugby and cricket it's becoming more and more commonplace but um with climbing what is that like so it's a bit of a two prong question Mm yeah um for sure i think um uh, yeah i think it's super important not to internalize it honestly um i think with regard to my own like mental state uh and you know my my capacity to perform under pressure and and just in my general life um i think i got some like advice all through my athletic career that um uh, building on my psychological strengths was something that i should give attention to and i was very dismissive of it i didn't necessarily understand how you know talking to a therapist or a sports psychologist and um seeking professional uh, guidance and professional assistance could be all that beneficial it seemed kind of pseudo to me at the time but um like having having like undergone that process and i have a really committed um helpful uh mental health team that you know help take care of me and make sure i'm fit not necessarily even in my climbing but just in my daily life and that's been such an important 
part of my growth as a person and as an athlete. Um, I think I think that there's a a somewhat like detrimental stance at the moment, like this this sort of a, a mantra, I guess, of you're not alone, and you know that everybody feels these ways sometimes, and everybody struggles with this. And I think, to, you know, in in one sense, it's really important for like destigmatizing mental health issues, but then in another sense, it can be destructive to a degree because you fall into these cycles that everybody feels the way you do, and therefore, what is there to do about it? And I think that it's really important to emphasize that that's not the case. And if you feel like you're struggling, and if you're considering getting help, then that's enough reason to do it. And I would kind of implore anyone to follow that path if they felt it was something that they could potentially benefit from, because they might surprise themselves with how much they're capable of. Yeah, definitely. And I think in every, any facet of your life, there are a lot of um, perks and benefits of, uh, you know, going to therapy and uh, working with psychologists, whether or not you are an athlete, uh, whether you do something else. But um, coming to your climbing career itself, Campbell, um, you know, it's, it's, you were, you were in lockdown in Melbourne. Melbourne's been really, really uh, unfortunate relative to the rest of Australia, particularly, uh, you know, I always speak from, from the Canberra perspective, and we've been really, really fortunate in that uh, being such a tiny place, nothing uh, really ever seems to happen here, but, <laughs> and COVID is, is, is also an example of that, but, um, you know, what do you think, uh, have been some of the challenges because of the last year and a half or so, uh, within your sort of sporting development and, you know, being in lockdown and what are some of the things, I mean, you know, what's done is done but this has impacted everybody significantly and with climbing gyms being closed for prolonged periods and you know you having to stay at home what are some of the things uh that didn't go the way you hoped uh as did most people uh but specific to your climbing journey because of obviously the pandemic yeah, um, I mean, bottom line, I guess, is that uh, nothing really went to plan. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, everything changed in this way that I never really fully understood that it would, you know, even as we were going into lockdown, um, you know, I never would have imagined that we would have been, that it would have affected my athletic career to such a degree. Um, and I think I've definitely felt over the last year and a half or so that, my athletic youth was getting away from me to a degree obviously i'm not i'm not old and you know, I have plenty of years to go but um you know all the competitions stopped all the training camps stopped um general access to the gyms stopped um and you know for a period there there was nothing um for elite sports people we were just yeah like you said i mean and like most of the population unfortunately just sitting at home wondering what to do with ourselves um and so yeah bottom line is that it changed everything we've had to learn to adapt um and it's you know slowly coming back into some semblance of normality um we're really lucky you know that elite athletes have access to training facilities throughout lockdowns um which is obviously crucial and we I wouldn't even be considering competing this year if that hadn't been the case if I didn't have access to those facilities um yeah and and even now looking at heading overseas for the world cup circuit just the concept of traveling and the preparation and the finances that go into into traveling uh have grown exponentially um so there are a lot of ways that it's changed and um, you know, coming back to, I guess, like mental health, you know, you have to build the skills to be able to adapt to all of these changes and roll with the punches a little bit, I think. Definitely. And, um, you know, while I, I recognize that obviously it must be really tough at the same time, I almost look at it like a jigsaw on a wall and you trying to solve a route. So I'm pretty sure you, you know, you'll, you'll, uh, You'll send it, mate, essentially. Uh, 
Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. But I did want to ask, um, what are sort of the next steps? What's what's coming up? You know, you talked about the World Cup circuit. What are you? What is? What are your plans for the next six months? Uh, what's going on? Yeah. So. Um, yeah, so essentially, like, I, I wasn't even considering the possibility that I would travel um, without vaccination. And then once that became a possibility for me, I started to consider the options. And um, I've had my first vaccination and I'll soon have my second dose. And then, yeah, I'll be heading overseas to compete in a handful of World Cups um, in Europe and hopefully the World Championships in Russia, assuming that they go ahead. Um, and so, yeah, the last little while has been madly preparing travel plans to make that happen. Um, and then, yeah, the next sort of three to four months will be very, very focused on performing uh, over at those competitions. Um, looks like we'll be having a national championship at the end of the year, which is which will be nice. Um, and yeah, I think. Like I said, over the COVID period, I we've had to build a lot of skills to be able to adapt to like whatever change that comes our way. And I think in some ways that's been super helpful um, to be able to like build those routines and build that resilience that's necessary to, to perform at a high level. So yeah, lots of, lots of stuff in the works, um, lots more than has happened over the last year or so. And so it's a, you know, scary, but exciting. <laughs> Definitely, definitely. And, um, you know, Campbell, you, you are a busy guy. And for that, you know, thank you for taking the time out to chat. Uh, for everyone watching or listening, wherever you are, be sure to go and follow uh, Campbell on social media to check out what he's doing. The IFSC does the live streams for the World Cup. So, you know, you can tune in and watch Campbell there as well, which will be awesome. Uh, Campbell, thanks so much, mate. It's an absolute pleasure chatting to you. Uh, first time in person, but once again, if we look at it uh, overarchingly and look, wish you all the best for the for the circuit. Uh, you know, hope the travels go well and uh, rooting rooting for you in Australia all the way, mate. Thank you. Yeah, uh, it's been a pleasure. I've had a really good time and yeah, hopefully chat again soon. <laughs>